the handwritten pieces had a 27 times greater response rate, so 2,700% greater response rate than print. And while it cost more, when you adjust it for that additional cost, it was still seven times greater ROI. So it's really about, you know, what's the end game? Is it to drive results or is it upfront cost? Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Data Unlocked podcast. In this podcast, we explore the ways in which data drives creativity and innovation. And we, and we explore that with the best and brightest in the industry. My name is Jason Davis, founder and CEO of Simon Data, a growth platform driving smarter marketing, customer experiences, and incremental customer lifetime value for brands like JetBlue, Equinox, and BarkBox. I'm thrilled today to have our guest, David Wax, on the podcast here. Uh, David joins us as founder and CEO uh, at Handwritten. Uh, David, uh, you're welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. So excited to be here. Great. Maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about you know, Handwritten and what you guys do. Handwritten uh, is nine years old. We've been doing this since 2014. We are the largest provider of automated handwritten notes in the world. The way we do this is with a, an army of, of handwriting robots that we build ourselves. So, so in our facility in, in Tempe, Arizona here, we, we have 175 robots. Each robot holds a real pen. The robots are all kind of autonomous and they sit there and write out um, notes and envelopes all day, every day. We handle on a good day around 20,000 pieces um, for actually for some shared brands. It turns out you and I have some shared clients, which is super cool, but our brands range from individual realtors all the way up to high-end luxury brands, um, car manufacturers, and and pretty much everything in between. And what we really do is we really help our clients stay connected with their customers in ways that are meaningful, personal, and and help build the 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 relationship there. I came from more of the the digital space, text messaging, and I was really looking for a way to connect in a way that's um, now that everybody's so inundated with with texts and emails that really stands out, and that's why we started handwritten. It's a great story, David. And yeah, you know, you know, for our listeners, you know, David and I were you know, connecting the other day around you know a shared customer, sort of a high-end e-commerce marketplace platform. And you know, at the end of the day, this customer sees the value of personalization, and they also really see the value of uh, bespoke, you know, one-to-one uh, touch points that you know handwritten and handwritten notes uh, provide, which I thought was super, super cool. You know, and that's really the topic of today's show. Um, you really just diving into. You know, direct mail is, you know, which has gone through a renaissance of sorts. You know, Ruby is asking some basic questions. You know, should you be sending your customers handwritten notes? You know, many listeners today are saying, hey, I send my customers emails. I target them with ads. Uh, you know, I haven't really considered uh, a handwritten note recently. You know, but you know, with this, you know, how should you think about your channel mix more broadly? Uh, and when you think about adding a new channel you know, to your strategy, you know, what are some of the key questions to ask? And what sort of you know, specific, interesting, and, and pretty awesome about handwritten that uh, maybe folks should consider you know, as part of their strategy. Tell us how it works. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure for for many listeners, uh, you yeah, know, the idea of spending uh, a few bucks for uh, you know, for, you know, for a, a single message to a customer, uh, you know, in this kind of format is something they hadn't haven't thought about uh, recently or even ever. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's not. You know, let's start with with cost. It's not going to be the cheapest because if you compare us even to junk mail, for lack of a better term, you know, that's typically some some flimsy pre-printed um, slick piece where the address is already pre-printed and the postage is pre-printed. What we do is the very first step we do is printing. We print a card for you, a thick, nice piece of stationery. And then everything after that is additional steps that junk mail doesn't have to go through. We feed it into a robot where it writes out the note that could take five minutes. We have to do that with the envelope. We then have to match card to envelope because we don't use a windowed envelope like you would with uh, junk mail. And then we have to put a real stamp on it. So it is going to be more expensive than bulk mail. However, we've done multiple studies and, and let me just give you one. We work with a car dealership that sent out bulk mail pieces and then tried handwritten note pieces. What they found was, and they were, the, the whole idea of the, the campaign was to drive people in store to look at a new car. They found the handwritten pieces had a 27 times greater response rate. So 2,700% greater response rate than print. And while it cost more, when you adjust it for that additional cost, it was still seven times greater ROI. So yes, it is more expensive, but if at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is drive results, you know, you could spend millions of dollars spamming people year after year and not seeing any results versus the same million dollars, you'll hit people less 
but drive greater results. So it's really about, you know, what's the end game? Is it to drive results or is it upfront cost? So we have a whole survey and I, I really recommend people go to our website, uh, handwritten.com spelled with a Y. And on there, if you go to the resources tab, there's the consumer outreach survey. And what we did there was we surveyed 2000 consumers, not related to handwritten, not customers of ours. And we asked them a number of questions like, do they feel appreciated by brands? And the vast majority, as you'll see in the survey results said no. And we said, well, what would make you feel appreciated by a brand? Uh, well, then we also asked them what's considered a personal form of communication. And we said a phone call, a text message, an email, or a handwritten note. They said, actually, the most personal form of communication is phone calls. Handwritten notes were a second. So that's good to know. And then we said, what, what are the most annoying forms of communication or run the risk of being annoying? And they said, the number one is phone calls. And handwritten notes run a very low risk of being considered annoying. So if you're trying to um, go between, you know, balance high value, high personalization with low annoyance factor, handwritten notes are really great to do that. And then we said, okay, do you feel appreciated by brands? And they said, no. And we said, if you feel appreciated by brands, what do you do? And they said, well, we spend more, we refer to friends, we have higher lifetime value, et cetera. And then we said, okay, well, what? would make you feel appreciated by a brand. And they said a handwritten note. And again, this is blind. This was all using uh, statistical analysis and coming out with these answers. But yeah, it's going to be more expensive. And should it replace emails? Absolutely not. Should it replace text? Absolutely not. But you should look to tactically or really strategically incorporate it in your overall marketing plan. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about handwritten with an I, you know, just the, the notion of sending an actual handwritten note. Whether you use us or another player to do it, that's up to you as you scale. But we're excited that we're one of the few companies out here really doing this and kind of making people rethink about the value of deep personalization and, and creating that bonds at scale. What life cycle moment, moments and where you know you know and, and what deployment mechanisms have you seen you know, to be most effective around where your customers are actually sending these out? Yeah, so to boil the ocean and try to do an outreach campaign and reach out to everybody in a neighborhood or a city or the country meeting certain demographic profiles, it's going to be very very expensive. I think a better use case is a thank you note campaign, and that's what really our company is really in the business of is saying thanks. So post-purchase, thank you to drive customer satisfaction, retention, and re-up. That's really, I would say, 90% of our business is saying thank you. And on top of that, we layer in two or three additional events per client. That's typically anniversary purchase or birthday card campaign, as well as holiday. We do a lot of holiday cards around here. So if you can layer in two to three touch points a year that include handwritten notes, you're way ahead of the game. But sending a thank you note is one of our biggest. Now for smaller brands that use Shopify stores, for instance, we actually plug into Shopify and put that on automatic where um, after your first purchase or you hit a purchase threshold, we can automate handwritten notes. But overall, just a thank you for purchase is kind of the big one for us. And actually that's what, what our, um, our shared client uses this for. That's great. And it really just begs to ask two questions. Sure. Yeah. The first is around personalization. The second is around measurement. Yep. Yeah, the thing I, I love about you know, spending several bucks on a highly effective message you know, is that you're spending several bucks. And as a marketer, you're really going to ask some questions around how do I make sure that I am, am, am deploying this as effectively as possible. This isn't uh -huh. an email where you're sending out you know, 500,000 Blast saying, you know, saying, "Hey, you know, you know, ten bucks off only today." Something which you know lacks creativity and lacks thought, but you know can make up for that. You know, by low, large numbers. This is something which you know by its nature is bespoke. By its by its nature needs to feel uh, as if it was highly personalized, one to one, and thought you know, and thought out. You know, you know, specifically to the recipient. And you know, when we sort of think about you know, you know, customer data, the opportunities around personalization. Uh, you know, this seems like an application where getting it right is just more critical than ever. I'll, I'll address the content. We kind of talked about that a little bit with with customization. You know, it's great to go in and thank the customer and include the category of product more than the product itself. I would say that. So, if you go to a high end luxury brand and buy the shark skin 
whatever, you know, like the shark skin wallet and, you know, in, in blue, you don't want the note to say, thank you so much for coming in and buying shark skin traveler's wallet in blue. You want it to say, thank you so much for coming in and buying your wallet. So it's really important, I think, to not hyper specify what people are buying because it's not going to seem real. So that's number one. As far as including complimentary products in there, we do that all the time. So thank you so much for coming in and buying your wallet. We really think you'd like to look at our matching suitcases or laptop bags, et cetera, and including that matching personalization in there. And, and that also helps drive measurement because then you can see, okay, people that have bought the wallet, how many of those are now buying the laptop bag or the suitcase or whatever that might be. So that's one way to do both in one is, is drive personalization and drive, drive um, ROI um, measurement. This isn't rocket science for the note itself. Um, we do have people that do include calls to action like, uh, you know, here's a coupon code, go to our website. We have one bespoke suit company that does that and they see a 16% redemption rate on coupons, which is substantially higher than any other coupon they send throughout the year. So you could do a coupon code in there as well, but driving, asking a lot of that client on a thank you, I would say destroys the value of the thank you. In this day and age with um, zero friction economy, where I can go to your website and buy from you, or I can go on Alibaba and design it myself and get it you know, mailed to me directly, or I can go to one of a million other whatever, uh, fashion brands or restaurants or whatever, people have unlimited choice. And I think everybody needs to be a little grateful for that purchase. And I think we need to just thank people, what I call a full stop, thank you. Just thank them, you know, full stop. Just thank them for their purchase. Don't ask them for a referral. Don't ask them to re-up. If you want to offer in a few suggestions, that's good. But anything beyond that, certainly don't ask for a QR code scan. You know, all those things seem gimmicky and destroy the value of the thank you. Yes, it's important to measure, 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 but it's also important to treat this person as a human and a client and market to them at a deeper level. And some of that is less measurable. A good example is I used to be in this text messaging business and we were planning a text message blast for a perfume brand and it would have cost them, I don't know, $10,000. And we sat in meeting after meeting after meeting about um, you know how they were going to do this text message campaign and, and and reach out. And then on the elevator ride down, I heard two of them talking about, yeah, you know, um, we're so excited. We're getting these mugs printed up and sending them out to our top fifty thousand clients. I'm like, what's that going to cost, right? Like, and it was way more. And so people want to measure certain stuff and then have zero interest in measuring other stuff. And I think everybody feels emails fully measurable. Um, so why not make handwritten notes fully measurable? Well, the more you try to make it measurable, the less sincere it seems, and it's going to ruin its value. I think you can do some of those little things we talked about to measure value. I think you can also look at, look at lifetime value of the customer and A-B test it. A perfect example with this is a snack box company we work with. They do office snacks. And what they found is if they screwed up with a client and maybe they didn't deliver the office snacks on time or sent them the wrong office snacks, they would then follow up and send a handwritten note apologizing for that, as well as some additional free office snacks. Now, granted, the additional free office snacks help. I'm not discounting that. But what they found was those that had a screw up experience had a much higher lifetime value than those that had never had that screw up and apology experience at all. So that was their A-B test. And then what they did was they systematized it and they said, well, if people that had a screw up experience are actually worth more overall, let's just screw up with everybody, right? So that's what they did is they raised all, all ships by just providing that to everybody after their A-B test. So I do think there's ways to A-B test this and check the long-term lifetime value without directly coming out and say, perform this action or do this for me, because what you should really be saying is thank you. It's a great point. And one of the topics that we've covered um, you know, so far this year uh, you know, with the economy uh, and the macro where it is, is really just thinking about ROI of your ad spend. Uh, yeah. And one of the traps that so many brands find themselves in is that there's so much pressure around short-term wins, so much pressure around last row contribution. Yep. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think what a lot of folks are, are worried about is driving their brand into the ground by over-optimizing around some of these digital channels uh, and over and, and over leveraging some tools like you know, Google Analytics that were designed solely to you know, have you spend more money on Google search ads. Uh, you know, and more more than ever, the, the question that you know that you know, CMOs are asking today 
you know, is how do I you know, not just increase conversion rates, but extend the LTV and drive my brand in a way that allows me to win on the other side of this? You know, how can I make those investments that uh, you know, I know are measurable at some, you know, to some extent, uh, but are also net positive uh, from a customer experience from a brand perspective? Yeah, yeah. And just asking, you know, if you send out these, these handwritten notes or whatever you're doing that's kind of above and beyond the digital quick hit, if it's not a revenue generator and it's not long-term lifetime value of the client, maybe you should still do a customer satisfaction, you know, net promoter score test or something and A-B test that way where, you know, they might not have actually purchased something, but they are, you know, maybe in that short-term horizon of a year, the long-term, your net promoter score is way, way higher. Maybe that's worth it to you as well. Every one of, 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 of Simon customers who are, you know, testing strategies like this, a holdout is really where we coach folks. Yeah, you know, because look, we all know, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a consumer. You just spend $1,000 on something high end. Um, you know, you get a note that costs, you know, that, you know, that really feels, you know, personalized and special, uh, you know, you're, you're not, you're, you're not just going to enjoy the item you bought, but the association with the, you know, with the marketplace, the retailer, the store, uh, is just amplified. Um, yeah. you know, is it amplified by $3? Well, if you're, you know, if your average purchase price is, a few, is over a thousand bucks, probably, I think for the right brand, um, yeah, it's one of the, it's one of these things where I think we, you know, every list I'm sure can put themselves in the shoes of their customers and really understand how this would be special. But I think it's really a matter of, you know, having the discipline to show that, hey, like there's, there's ROI here. And by the way, with something like this, you know, I'd advocate to, to our customers that it doesn't necessarily have to be clearly ROI positive, you know, because the brand effects uh, are just going to be longer term. And you ask, how does something like this affect your loyalty program and your referrals uh, and your word of mouth? I'll tell you something, it's a lot more than a, a brand keyword that you bought on, on Google ads. Uh, and you're probably sinking you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a month on. Yeah, 100%. So I'll give you an example. We work with a online brand. Their cost of, of material you know, for the product, it's a, it's a type of sock that they're selling. Their cost of material is like three bucks. Well, they sell it primarily through Facebook and Instagram ads, and they're selling it in a bundle, total cost of material, nine bucks for 65 or $70. Why is that? Because their cost per acquisition is through the roof. You know, there's, you know, competing on Facebook and Instagram, a hundred percent of their cost pretty much is cost per acquisition. It's not the cost of the product. So if you're able to improve retention rates just by a couple basis points or improve uh, referral rates, not asking for a referral, just, you know, people become brand advocates and, and, um, you know, zealots of your brand, that very well could be worth it. You know, if your cost per acquisition is so crazy high, trying to keep that customer around. I mean, every, in my business, the number one cost we have is the cost of acquiring and retaining a client. So if you're able to drive the cost down on retention, that's huge. And we think, you know, if you're if you're buying a premium product or, you know, whether it's a piece of art or a piece, piece of furniture or a car, you know, what's three bucks, really? I mean, your cost per acquisition was way higher than three bucks uh, that'll cost you to mail a note. Final question. Uh, before we you know summarize and wrap, uh, you know, if you were to have if you could have this conversation again with anyone in the world, uh, you know who would it be and why? I could say two people. Number one would be my younger self when we sent out millions of texts for you know uh, large retail brands. The other person though, what I would say is one of these the CEO of a large email house such as Apollo IO. And I don't know if you've been fallen victim to it, victim to it as I have, but every day. I get these le emails that look like real emails from somebody trying to sell me something and it's spam. And then if you don't reply, they send you another email saying, just bring in this to the top of your inbox. And then if you don't want to reply again, hey, David wanted to make sure you saw this. So it's not good enough that they're spamming you once and annoying you once. They keep doing it until you respond. And you know how much is that hurting your brand? That would be my question to the head of those types of companies. How much is this hurting your brand by constantly spamming your customer versus sending a one-time thoughtful handwritten note upon thank you know upon sale to thank them for their purchase? And yes, those emails are 100% trackable. But what's not trackable is the damage it's doing to your brand. 100%. And I think uh, yeah, you can measure that you know, somewhat through unsubscribes, but you know not everyone uns unsubscribes either. Uh, yeah. You know, so those associations, you never know what's going through the you know, the mind of your 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 customers as they're sitting in their Gmail 
uh, and just clicking delete, delete, delete. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the especially now with ChatGPT and all these other platforms that are just writing, it's just so easy to send an email. It's so easy to send an email that this is becoming the default, as it should be, the default way for people to, to communicate with their customers, but it's not always the right way. We work with a lot of nonprofits and they're the number one issue nonprofits have, or one of their number one issues is redonation rate. So they spend a lot of money, get, and this applies beyond nonprofits, but uh, they spend a lot of money getting that donor, that donor donates, and then only about 42% of donors redonate the following year. And when asked why they're not redonating, the number one reason is they don't feel thanked. Now, if I were to look at this, I would say there's, there's three reasons for that. Number one is you sent them an email and it was a chat GPT or automated email, you know, Hey, Jason, thank you so much for your donation. And people know it's BS, right? So they don't feel thanked because it's an insincere. Thank you. Number two, is you sent them a sincere email, thank you, thanking them for their donation, but they didn't open it because it went to their spam folder or they assumed it was an insincere thank you. So again, even though you spent the time to write them a, hand, uh, a long, nice email, they didn't read it. So you're still out the same amount, or you sent them a slick mail piece that they didn't open because it went straight to the recycler. So there's cases where you are doing everything right but your message isn't getting opened. And if it's not opened, what's the point, right? And, and if you're especially trying to thank people and, and improve your re-engagement rate, your, redo your redonation rate, your long-term value, all of those types of things, but your message isn't getting opened, it's getting delivered, it's just not getting open, what's the point? So I think there's a case to be made for handwritten notes um, for that as well. No, totally. Uh, well, David, thank you for for coming on the podcast today and, and sharing your wisdom with us. I, you know, I, I personally found the conversation to be fascinating across two dimensions. The first dimension is, uh, yeah, let's talk about handwritten notes and yeah. you know, how it fits into your marketing strategy, your brand strategy, you know, your customer experience. Uh, and then, of course, there's the analytical side. Uh, let's really look at your channel mix and let's ask these very, very cut and dry questions. Yep. Is there ROI there? Uh, am I spending money in the right place? Am I spending money in, in the place today just because you know I have the systems uh, and the analytics set up you know, you know, in a way that's convenient? Uh, or do I actually have a channel mix and a channel strategy that's driving the right results you know, given the shape uh, you know, and nature of, of my brand, my product, uh, my customer base? Um, you know, and uh, you know, these, you know, ultimately getting these questions right uh, you know, really you know, involve that you know, right mix of, of making sure the conversion rates are great and then driving the brand, you know, in a way that, uh, you know, can ultimately drive, you know, you know incremental you know, LTVs and put your CAC to LTV ratio as well in, in a great place to scale the, the business. One of the downfalls of our business is we don't have that closed loop. We are starting to do some QR codes, but I kind of think those are a gimmick. So we don't often know if our clients are having success with it. But what I can tell you is a lot of the clients we have have stuck around for five, six years or more. So because of that, I have to assume it is, you know, why would they do this otherwise? And just to leave you with one last story. Now, this is going to be a much smaller story than, than any of your clients, but we work with a piano tuner and he comes in your house once a year to tune your piano. You only need to tune your piano once a year. After tuning your piano, he set up an automation to send you one of our handwritten notes thanking you. A year later, he comes back to your house to tune your piano again. That handwritten note is often standing up on the piano. And that is not real estate you can buy. You can't buy that real estate. You can't buy a billboard or a digital ad, you know, sitting in front of their most prized possession in what my parents called growing up the fancy room of the house, right? Like that's you put your piano in your most prized location in your house. You cannot buy that, but you can do it through the power of a handwritten note. And I so every time somebody sits down and plays the piano, they think, oh, gee, I got to call Jim in a year. He was such a nice guy. He sent me that handwritten note. You know, there's real value there. No, that uh, reminds me. My, my mother, too, has her uh, her fancy room. Now. Yep. <laughs> Don't touch uh, the face. White part and, and white carpet, right? So, Yep, something like that. The room you never go into. Uh, for our, our listeners who want to learn more about handwritten, uh, you know, where, where should they go and uh, you know, how do they find you? Yeah, so handwritten, it's spelled with a Y. So it's H A N D W R Y T T E N. Go to handwritten.com. I highly recommend clicking the business tab and filling out the form to get free samples set to you. We'll send you a whole kit so you can see for yourself if this looks real. And then also clicking resources at the top and finding that consumer outreach survey. It's about a year old now, but 
I, I don't think anything's changed in the year. People, you know, people don't change that quickly. So just learning about people's preferences for different brands, handwritten notes, not always being the, the most, I think could be valuable to all your listeners. Great. And thank you to everyone listening to this episode of the Data Unlock podcast. If you'd like to learn more about Simon Data, please visit us on the web at simondata.com or email us at hello at simondata.